Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with my old pal Richard Fox, a political scientist who uh, used to teach at uh, Central New Mexico Community College and at UNM. We're here today to try and put into context um, the struggle over education in New Mexico. And uh, the context has to do, I believe, with the midterm elections next year. So I'd like you to sort of, if you could, uh, talk to us a little bit about Hannah Scandera and her connections to the Bush organization and how, how our problems in New Mexico were playing out on this national stage. Again, it's nice to be back with the, with the Mercury. It's wonderful to have you here. And, um, well, uh, everybody is all in for the 2014 election. Right. This midterm, they always say that this one is really the important one, but this time it is really the important one. Uh -huh. um, for President Obama, it probably will determine his legacy. And right now, what you see Obama doing is you see him running essentially a second presidential campaign for a third term. Right. That's effectively what what is what is happening. Um, quickly, the the Democrats are probably not going to retake the House, and they'll probably hold retain the Senate, but the equation won't change in terms of heavy-duty partisanship, polarization, and and essentially dysfunction right. um, in 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 Washington. Now, to put to give it a, an additional context, education in New Mexico is is right in the middle of this education reform. Um, particularly in education reform in education you have you have as in politics you have four questions always always the questions first the biggest question of all is who decides who's going to decide the second question is always who pays and I don't mean just money yeah the third question is who benefits and the fourth question is who will be burdened long term this is sort of the, 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 and all of this relates to education, and all of it is intensely political. Um, there are three big pieces of unfinished business in America today. The first is race. The second is poverty. And the third is education. Wow. And obviously they all conflate. They all, they all hang together. Yes, they do. Poverty, of course, we know, uh, study after study for decades, we know that poverty is a big part of poor learning. Right. We know that bad health, um, we know that poor living conditions, we know that domestic problems at home create a tremendous amount of stress Absolutely. on young people. Right. And it can only lead to, 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 um, to poor learning. Now... Education is, is afflicted with what I call this cost disease. Education is labor intensive. And I know you want to you talk about online learning yeah. a bit. And we'll get to that. But the cost disease I'm talking about in education is education like the performing arts is extremely labor intensive. Right. Um, therefore, there are less opportunities to increase productivity, if you will, to use that word, oh, boy. Um, yeah. by infusing it with cash, money. In other words, it's much more difficult to substitute capital in the edu in education right. for labor. Yes, it's much more it's much more difficult to do that. So the cost disease, of course, that everything then has to be efficient. Everything has to be cost cutting. Everything has to be bottom dollar. And clearly, this this is uh, this is something that's that's uh, punishing, really, educational quality. So, what we're really talking about here, when we talk about for-profit schools and the so-called corporatization of schools, and um, and the uh, computerization of schools, which I know we're going to get into in a little bit longer, is basically it's a kind of union busting on a on a very subtle scale. You're getting rid of labor, replacing it with robots. Uh, it would seem to me. 
certainly the goal for the for the private sector in all of this is the privatization of education. Um, it's no secret. It's been no secret for a long time that business, maybe even the Chamber of Commerce, want wants to run schools. They want to run education. And this, of course, is antithetical to to any democratic notion of a public good. Education is our greatest, I think, our greatest public good. Yeah. And public education is key to an informed citizenry. Informed citizenry, of course, is key to um, running a democracy. <laughs> and this requires equal opportunity in education. Our goal, um, our national goal, has to be um, to educate every child. Not just the wealthiest, not just the best looking, not just the middle class, but to ever educate every child. Absolutely. Now this is, this is not the goal of private, for-profit, corporatized schools. Educating every child is certainly not the goal. Um, the goal for eventually for privatizing schools is profit. Yes. And one of the mistakes I think that we make is, is that we, we, we think that there once was probably, we think in the 50s, there was a golden age of education. But there really wasn't. Um, I know, I know President Kennedy talked about Sputnik and, yeah. and we all have. But the 1950, in the 1950s, I, I do think it was no golden age, but education was easier then. And I think there, there are some reasons for that. One is, in the 50s, schools were, desegre were, were segregated. Right. We had many segregated schools. Second, there were very few kids in school with disabilities. Hmm. If there were, we hadn't really identified them. Yes, there was uh, special education, but that wasn't, that's not really what I'm, what I'm referring to. So you had segregated schools, you had very few kids with uh, disabilities, physical or mental or uh, special education needs. And everybody spoke English. And today, that's that's completely gone. It has been gone for many years. Thank God, really. And thank God, in a way. It's a good thing. And yet, it's made education more difficult. Sure. It's made it a struggle. Um, in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson, well, President Kennedy, of course, but Lyndon Johnson really accelerated um, this idea of an equal chance for every kid to get a good education in the Ben Franklin mold. <laughs> yes. And this began with Title I. Title I was money for the neediest students in American education, in public education. Um, it was Washington-centered. Right. It was centered in Washington. It was part of the Great Society with Medicare and Medicaid and all the rest of it in the 60s. Um, in the 70s, things deteriorated. Growing inequality, growing poverty, political and social tumult, if you will. In 1983, a great turning point for education, um, we had the report, A Nation at Risk. Right, yes. And this was, this was something of a, of a turning point because out of it came the concept, maybe even obsession, with accountability. Right. Um, and I'm getting to the the profit, non-profit, um, online, I, I, I promise. <laughs> um, and with accountability came the fact that we had to measure everything. We had to measure everything, and with that accountability to measure everything came the business model. It's going to, we have to run it like a business. We have to manage it like a business. And we have to be able to measure outcomes. We have to get results very much like you'd get in a business or a corporation. Or even government has tried this with various mostly failed schemes. So, and this was all done with statistics. It was all done with data. And of course, 
the centerpiece of data collection and statistics is the standardized test. At the same time that we had uh, this, this rise of standardization, this almost homogenization of education, we had uh, started to, to almost actually do away with certain of the most egregious aspects of segregated education. We began to incorporate students uh, of a non-traditional nature. We had, we had begun to, uh, to begin to try to, to in some way ameliorate the, the terrible stresses of poverty on children. And yet at the same time, we are now that we've been inclusive, which is the best thing we could ever be, now suddenly we're becoming homogenized, which is one of the worst things we could be. So we have these standardized tests. I think, I think that's right. And with homogenization, with standardization, comes corporatization. Right. And it comes a part of this business model, this, this um, very much like we want to run the schools like a business. Teachers, educators, become the labor force. And they have to be managed. They have to produce results. Right. They have to produce certain kinds of what we think we hope would be positive outcomes. Let's, let's, let's stipulate. Um, educational institutions, schools, elementary, secondary, uh, institutions of, of, of education are much too complex. The learning process is much too complex to, to narrowly standardize it and have the major metric be the results of standardized tests. It's much too complex. Learning, as you know more than most, um, is, is a much too multifaceted process. To standardize. Right, right, exactly. Teacher evaluation. Evaluate, evaluating teachers is virtually impossible with the primary basis of that evaluation being a standardized test. And that's what's happening. That's the homogenization. That's the standardization. And what's been, what's been produced um, has been a bunch of fearful, anxiety-ridden, demoralized, and in many cases, angry teachers. And they're wow. angry because they have been uh, essentially removed from the reform process. Wow. They've sort of made, made secondary in this process with the attack on teacher unions and in an effort to, to center the reform on teachers, ironically, paradoxically, Teachers have been pushed out of the reform process, right. pretty much. They, they yeah. have been uh, pushed aside. Yeah. And they're angry about it, and rightfully so. They, they are indeed uh, angry. Now, with no child left behind, this, of course, is the, the focus of the, of the anger since 2007. Um, no child left behind, or as some wags put it, no consultant left behind. <laughs> basically, um, is, has very few supporters these days. Um, certainly, certainly not in the, in, the, in, the, in the ranks of teachers, because teachers under No Child Left Behind have become the problem. The search for great teachers has been picked up by some very well-intended foundations, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to be one of them, and even Eli Broad, the great home builder in, in California, mm -hmm. has, has a big education foundation. And um, they, have, they have made teachers the center of the reform by infusing millions of dollars into various foundations and, and schools to find great teachers. Well, the teachers are there. In the process... There has been this, as you put it, this homogenization, this standardization. And right in the middle of it is the business model. Uh, run it like a business, run it like a corporation, demand results based on narrow metrics. Which basically then undermines the whole notion of great teaching because great teaching doesn't 
mean that you're going to teach to some statistical norm or some or some huge statistical bullseye. Uh, you're going to try to empower students and draw the best out of them and draw the unique qualities out of them. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And we know that, that learning, uh, maybe learning and education are distinctions without differences, but yeah. we know that learning is about, it's about knowledge, particularly self-knowledge, and it's about understanding. Yes, it is. And this is a this is a process that is well beyond um, the capture of a standardized test, which have been misused and abused. And they've been again they've been the the most prominent metric in evaluating teachers and evaluating students. Um, very 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 um, very homogenized. Um, in this process. Uh, of homogenization comes the corporation and comes the, the education foundation and comes the for-profit education company right. and they're all involved nationally on a nationwide scale and in terms of online education which again we'll get to in a minute um, they are right in the middle of it here in New Mexico as we'll see when we talk about um, Secretary Scandera the secretary designate, right? I think so. But is it possible that she has become the secretary uh, even though she hasn't been confirmed? Not to be disrespectful, but I think that's in her own mind. You may well be right on that. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that, that um, Republican educators have said, we're just going to do it and be damned if there's any opposition. Um, I don't know, but this may have been what's happened here. In all of this, in all of this standardization and, and the, the uh, infusion of, of for-profit education companies, foundations, uh, Gates, Broad, all the rest, um, you, you still have the goal. The, the prize, the eye on the prize, is still privatization of public education. Oh that, that remains the goal. Um, so with No Child Left Behind, and all you have to do to, to see this is talk to some teachers. Um, I know a lot of them. I'm married to one. Um, you find you have the, the, the train wreck, really, yeah. of sweatshop reform. Mm. You, have, you, have a, you have teachers who are now working in, 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 in sweatshops, so to speak figuratively speaking, and enormous pressure to get results through standardized tests. Dubious results. And often dubious results. We know that. We know. And probably the most, the most dubious of all is, of course, um, I've, I've been traveling in the Midwest, um, Chicago and Iowa. And I'm in, I'm in Davenport, Iowa, and I, I pick up the newspaper and I find that in Davenport, um, here's little old Madison Elementary School. Now, Iowa has, has a pretty good education system. Um, I hope that No Child Left Behind doesn't, doesn't undermine that. But here at Mad little Madison Elementary School in Davenport, Iowa, we have this big cheating scandal yes. regarding standardized oh tests. Oh, my God, yes. Um, in this case, it involved erasing far more answers than could be credibly expected from, a, from, a, from an elementary school standardized test. But um, the inevitable consequence of using standard and abusing standardized tests to this extent, the inevitable consequence is cheating. In Atlanta, you have Beverly Hall, the yeah. superintendent of... of uh, Schools in, in Atlanta, enormous scandal right. um, regarding cheating, which not where, where you, had, uh, you had administrators allegedly changing the answers to get good results. In El Paso, this is, this is um, um, tragic. In El Paso, you have a scandal involving standardized tests to get proficiency, to get good scores, 
here you have the the superintendent of schools in El Paso, or uh, he may have been a principal, basically telling certain students not to come to school on test day. Students have actually, so to speak, disappeared in El Paso oh because they don't want them there to take the tests because they'll lower the scores. Oh, my gosh. In Washington, D.C. Now, this is the home of, or was the home of, the star-studded Michelle Ree program. Right. And she leaves, and she's not with um, uh, Washington, D.C. schools anymore. She's not the chancellor, but she is... Um, heading up a, a, a multi-million dollar organization called Students First. In her wake, when she left D.C., there, there's, a, there's, an, there's a huge cheating scandal right. involving these tests that have been, that have been abused. Um, so this is, a, this is indeed an inevitability. When you put a person's job, when you put a teacher's job on the line based on a standardized test, or a series of tests. Mm -hmm. When you put a principal's job on the line based on test scores, um, you are going to have cheating inevitably. So you have demor here are the unintended consequences of all this homogenization of education, corporatization of education. So you have cheating, which will become more widespread. Um, you have a bunch of demoralized teachers. You have attacks on, on teacher unions. And teacher professional organizations, and you have, you have a case where real reform becomes misplaced. Right. It's completely misplaced. Learning, knowledge, education, a sophisticated process, uh, essentially is 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 put aside, to to administer the system. And now we see the 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 attempt to administer the system, come in very sharp, in a very sharp and pointed way into New Mexico, in a way that's, uh, that's polarizing the educational establishment in the state that's, uh, and the governor's office, in a way that's, that is um, uh, increasing demoralization that's already existed for quite a while here. Uh, what is, how does this terrible predicament in New Mexico play out? How is it uh, connected to this national context in this election. All of this is playing out in New Mexico. What you have is a, is, a, is a growing battle between our greatest public good, which is education, and versus education as a business. Right in the middle of this, you have virtual, what is virtual education reform, or online learning, <laughs> which is leading to online schools. That is, that, is the, that is the great piece of privatization, to make schools, to create online schools. And, of course, the private sector has a, a huge stake because there are nationally, there are trillions of dollars, public dollars here at stake. And also because online education implies a greatly reduced teacher <laughs> workforce, there's a, there's a huge cut in overhead and a tremendous chance to make greater profits, no? Indeed. With, and this is the, this is the issue that's certainly, it's, it's, it's there. It, it hasn't been debated as much as it should in New Mexico. But the labor issue is, is right there. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not really... A subtext. It's more than that, but it hasn't quite reached the level of a lot of the other issues that are being debated. But but it will be. Yes. Here here's what's happened overall in America. I think over the last um, oh maybe maybe thirty years, with technology, we have we have improved American productivity in in many many fields, sure. in business, in the public sector. With technology, we have improved productivity. But as we have improved productivity, wages, wages have not kept pace. Absolutely. With that, with that technological increase, uh, increasing productivity. So what do you have? You have a situation where you can do more things 
indeed get more productivity with fewer people. Now, now that is that is a revolution that's happening, not just in education, but it's it's beginning to. But that's a revolution that's happening across the economy. I, I recall distinctly my 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 third grade teacher in grammar school. Her name was Mrs. Marone. I can still hear her. She once said to me, Richard, someday your job will be done by a robot. Now, this was said by a third grade grammar school teacher in the, 19, was, in the 1950s. She was right. Honey. And she was right. Yeah. Someday your job will be done by a robot. So what you're saying is exactly right. Productivity may be increased. Efficiency, which is not really a goal of the learning process, no. may be increased, but you can do it with fewer teachers. Um, and there's a great deal of profit to be made by from supplying the equipment to supplying the software to supplying the curriculum. And that's where the private corporation, the private for-profit school companies are waiting. Well, indeed, they're they're already here in New Mexico. I'll tell you about a couple of them in a minute. But they're already here, and, and there are trillions of dollars at stake. Um, right in the middle of all of this is, is Secretary-designate Scandera. Secretary Scandera is a Jeb Bush protege. She was a deputy commissioner of education in, in Florida. And... She has ties to one of two, maybe both, of Jeb Bush's educational foundations. One is called um, the Foundation for Educational Excellence. FEE, as it's called. <laughs> and the other one is called the Foundation, the Foundation for Florida's Future. The one that Secretary-designate Scandera has a, a tie to is, is um, the Foundation for Educational Excellence. Fee, as it's called. And Fee is, of course, lobbying for and supporting and advocating private, for-profit, online schools. This begins with requiring online courses in high school, or maybe in middle school, or maybe even elementary school. Requiring online courses in the beginning to graduate. Then, um, as it's supposed to evolve in the private sector, uh, online courses are supposed to evolve into online schools, private for profit. Now, the problem that Secretary Scandera is having with uh, Linda Lopez's committee is one is is that in the legislature in in the in the New Mexico legislature, excuse me, um, is number one that that. Scandera is not seen as, first of all, a real educator, an educator, not simply an educational administrator, because I don't know how broadly based her experience is in the classroom. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think there's very much of that. So she's not seen as an educator. She's seen as basically an implementer. She is implementing No Child Left Behind, and she's also working... I think very hard to implement the private sector business privatization agenda. Um, she lacks New Mexico experience. She really doesn't know um, the endemic issues of New Mexico education. And yet she's here. And I think the, the Governor Martinez, Republican Jeb Bush, Hannah Scandera, uh, connection um, shouldn't be any surprise to anybody, um, and it's a partisan issue, and and well, it should be, given these connections and uh, to to Jeb Bush basically, right, right. who is a, who is the um, I think my prediction the likely Republican nominee in 2016. So, private companies are driving education reform in New Mexico. And it takes two forms. Number one is there is a New Mexico Virtual Academy. There already exists? That already exists in New Mexico. Wow. Second, 
There is a private company, education company in New Mexico, called K-12 Incorporated. And they are the ones that have established the New Mexico Virtual Academy. But it's the second one that's more interesting. And certainly um, making progress uh, for an online school. And that is the New Mexico Connections Academy. Hmm. Now, this is a, this is a, um, uh, a, a private, for-profit school. It's it, New Mexico Connections Academy. It is a statewide academy. Um, it will have 500 students in the fall. Wow. Fall of 2013. Hmm. In five years, the goal for the New Mexico Connections Academy is to have 2,000 students. Statewide, in in New Mexico, and this, the New Mexico Connect Connections Academy, has been um, pushed, indeed lobbied for by by our friends at the Rio Grande Foundation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the right wing think tank, the libertarian think tank here in 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 uh, New Mexico. Paul Gessing, who likes to call himself an advocate um, for private for profit schools is basically has been a lobbyist for New Mexico Connections Academy. Now that that school was approved. Well, first it was rejected. It was disapproved by the Public Education Commission. But Secretary Designate Scandera, as reported by the Albuquerque Journal, um, Secretary Scandera um, rejected the rejection. The, the, the rejected the PEC's rejection <laughs> and approved the New Mexico Connections Academy on appeal. It's, a, it's an online charter school. She approved it over the objections of the um, Public Education Commission. She approved that. Now, there have been two bills in the last session of the legislature. Two bills, that, and I don't know whether Governor Mar what action Governor Martinez has taken on them. But there were two bills in, last, in the last session of the legislature. One was to prohibit the Secretary of Education, whoever it is, to overrule the decisions on these matters, on charters, uh, to prohibit the Secretary to overrule the decisions of the PEC. Oh. I don't know what happened to that bill. Um, second, the second bill was to, to prohibit private curriculums. Hmm. In public schools, hmm. this is a big thing. This is this is where um, private um, educational companies make much of their money by by supplying curriculums to public schools in America. Wow. Um, so I don't know the I don't know the outcome of those bills, but we know that in all while all of this was transpiring, we know that there were thousands of emails between um, the Bush Organization, uh, the Foundation for Educational Excellence, and New Mexico officials, and school officials all around the country to push online education and online schools as done by private companies. Uh, we know there are thousands of emails. This, too, was reported by the Albuquerque Journal. So... Basically, what's happening to education in New Mexico is that it's become a sort of, at once, a battleground and a uh, sort of sort of sacrificial lamb in national politics, uh, in which um, these these ancient forces, the public good and the private profit, uh, are battling once again. And basically, it seems to me, chewing up our whole educational system uh, and causing a tremendous amount of grief and in the long run economic suffering and, and even psychological suffering for our children. You put it well. Uh, in all of this, parents and children and the learning process and what it takes to educate <clears throat> students in a democracy is all being lost. Um, and there are, nationwide, there are trillions of dollars at stake in this battle. 
that those are that's the, those are the stakes in this battle between business and and and, and what I think is the public good yeah. education um, trillions of dollars at stake because um, these private efforts uh, under the auspices of reform are basically taking millions of dollars away from public education right. now that that is where the 2014 <coughs> election comes into the picture education reform um, it may not be immigration, it may not be Benghazi, it may not be the IRS uh, targeting people, but education reform is, is certainly in the mix, certainly at the state level, in all of these midterms. It's always an, an issue in New Mexico. Um, and I think genuine, genuine education reform at the second, uh, elementary and secondary level is being, is being lost. Which brings us to um, 2014 and Governor Martinez and uh, whether or not she's going to be reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, let me talk about it like this. So far, and I mean this with all respect, um, so far Governor Martinez has been what I would call a nothing special governor. Um, her record, her administration's record to date is undistinguished. She's had a great deal of cabinet turnover out of the first, uh, in the first term, a great deal of, of uh, undistinguished officials working hard for, for New Mexico, um, but there's been a great deal of turnover. I think that Governor Martinez is still on the steep side of the governing learning curve hmm. in New Mexico. So her election, is, her re-election, excuse me, is, is hardly a sure thing despite the fact um, that she remains relatively popular in, in, uh, in New Mexico. Now, she's also a kind of minor star in the Republican constellation of stars. And the question really is, because she's motivated, I think, largely by her personal history um, and her persona and her political ambition, so the question becomes for 2014 in New Mexico, as far as her re-election is concerned, is will New Mexico favor her personal history and her personality over things like education reform and jobs? Right. Will they favor, which will they favor? Yes. That's, that's, that's is indeed a, um, that is indeed a, a question. So, if you look back on how Governor Martinez was elected in 2010, you see the following. Number one, we see a trend in political science that, n not just in New Mexico, but, but in, in, in America, we see this preference for more and more women office holders. It's a trend, and I think, I think a good one. Um, and the preference for women is, is about people see women as being uh, better able to compromise, better able to cooperate. And on, on a lot of issues, including issues like gun control, they see these issues, war, for example, they see these issues differently than men. Um, this is also a matter of, of, of lots of, of uh, academic studies. Now, in 2010, we had strong anti-Richardson sentiment. We had a, a Republican sweep nationwide in the midterms. Very fateful election for Democrats. Um, we have a subtle anti-immigrant sentiment in New Mexico. And we had a weak, relatively weak Democratic candidate. So that's how she was elected in the first place. Um, the Democrats need a strong effort. They need a strong effort. Right now, I, I see them having a relatively weak bench. Uh, we have one candidate, Attorney General Gary King, is in the race. We don't know who else will run. We don't know if there'll be a, a contested primary or not, Democratic side. Um, so the Dems need a strong national effort. They need some coattails here, here in, in New Mexico in, in 20, uh, 2014. Um, and I, I think that education reform is going to be one of three salient issues in this state. Um, if she wins re-election, 
I think you're going to see uh, an aggressive push, not only for uh, virtual education reform in New Mexico, uh, a real push, but you're also going to see an accelerated anti-union mm -hmm. effort sure. with more, I mean, we, we already resolved this issue once in, in, during the, the King administration with right to work legislation. Right. I think you'll see a reappearance of right to work legislation in New Mexico if Governor Martinez wins. Um, I, I think you'll see Governor Martinez uh, beginning to morph into what I would call Scott Walker light here here in here in New Scott Mexico. Scott Walker being the Scott Walker being the governor of Wisconsin. Right. She's done one thing that's helped her election, or will help her reelection, and she's done one thing that's hindered it. Um, one is she's she's approved New Mexico Medicaid expansion. That's that's a good thing. But to veto a raise in the minimum wage in New Mexico is no way to get reelected. Yes. Um, so you have a plus and you have a minus. She walks a tightrope between the Republican right wing base and the moderate, more establishment wing of the Republican Party. That that is her that is her tightrope. So um, it, it may be early, but that's the way I see it at the moment. Just to wrap it up again, is there any way to, to actually predict uh, what might happen to public education if a big sort of um, avalanche of private for-profit schools actually takes hold in New Mexico? That's a difficult question to answer. Sure. I mean, uh, I wish, I, I I wish I knew, but let me say this: um, business efforts to run public schools are going to be continuing, and they're going to be accelerating. And behind these efforts are millions of dollars from foundations. Some of the most reputable, credible foundations in America right. are fueling this effort. So. The battle, as we've said, uh, as we've called it, uh, between a public good, public education, an essential for democracy, and um, education as a business based on markets and choices is going to, weigh, is going to rage on. Um, what it means is, is that we decide things in America by votes. And uh, what it means is, is the right people have to be elected to public office and the right people have to be directly involved in reforming education. Um, and that's not happening right now. Richard, you've given us a picture of something that uh, we probably haven't all of us thought about that clearly. Um, uh, it's, I think the battle has been engaged. It's very clear what it's about. Uh, and it has a tremendous consequence for us in New Mexico. And I want to thank you hugely for for making things as clear as you have here. Hope to have you back again uh, in the old, the old library at New Mexico Mercury. Thanks very, very much for, for having me today.